those who chose the responsive reading and the song, because as I was preparing for this presentation, whatever we call this thing that I do up here, <clears throat> one of the things that was brought to my awareness was that recently a Supreme Court justice was quoted as saying, our Constitution, after all, is all about democracy. <laughs> Nowhere in either the Constitution nor the Declaration of Independence is the word democracy used. Nowhere. However, the word liberty is many times. The word freedom is offered over and over and over again. Our Constitution, our Declaration of Independence, guarantees, is designed to guarantee that each and every one of us may exercise and live from that which we know within to be true, or that which we feel in the moment, at least, could be true. So I wanted to read the principle that I'm here to talk about today. The right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and society at large. It's not that this country is saying the democratic process is the most important thing. It's saying that the democratic process is a means by which everyone may use and rely on their conscience. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights Article 18, one of the few times you'll hear me read something. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others, and in public or private, to manifest one's religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. Observance. Every single <coughs> member of this agreement, everyone who has signed, every nation that has signed this agreement has said that we are entitled to, that we must enjoy these rights, and of course, every nation on the planet has managed to mess it up once or twice. <laughs> it's a possibly Bhutan. Bhutan, where they have a minister of happiness. Yeah. We have a defense minister. <laughs> so when we understand the, the two are woven, the three are woven, liberty, conscience, and democratic process. Things begin to make sense in a way they may not have otherwise. How can every person have the right to act based on their own conscience if someone is telling them what to do? It's not possible. We have to have the right to act from that individual conscience and to allow others to do the same. And that's one of the qualities of the Unitarian Universalists that actually the Unitarian Universalists inherited from a very American tradition called the Congregational Church. The Congregational um, Bishop, if you will. It is a way that each congregation makes its own choices. That never existed prior to the Puritans in this country when they arrived in North America, in Western culture, nobody had done this before. There was always someone up there telling you what to do. But throughout New England, every community formed their own little church. And the elders of the community were the elders of the church. And they would hire ministers as they saw fit, and they would fire ministers as they saw fit when it didn't match, when it didn't work. And they maintained the building, and the building was often used as town hall as well as church, etc., etc., etc. So that model 
was what was in place in Massachusetts when the Unitarians began to become the more and more prevalent ministries in Massachusetts because Harvard was graduating Unitarians. Harvard Divinity School is a Unitarian Divinity School, one of two in the nation. So when Ralph Waldo Emerson graduated from Harvard Divinity School, he was um, called to a ministry at the Second Church in Boston, which was a congregational church. It was run by the elders. There was nobody telling them what to do. There was no, you know, nobody in charge except the people there. And so he went, and you know, brand new, fresh, young minister, and you know, trained in Unitarian philosophy. His father had been a congregational minister, had actually been a minister at Second Church in Boston 30 years before. And so now here he is, and he's all fresh and happy, and he's the assistant minister, and, and oh my goodness, I have to go meet all these people. You mean I can't just get up in front of them and read my poetry and teach my philosophy? Okay, if you make me. <laughs> but he did. And then the senior pastor was gone one year at Easter. I've told this story before, but I love it. So you get to hear it again. And um, it was going to be Easter services. And this was a congregational church, but it had been a very Christian church in the traditional sense, derived from the, Pur the Puritans who landed in Massachusetts. And they fully expected to celebrate all the um, bells and whistles on Easter, <laughs> the smells, bells, candles, and everything, including communion. And he said, excuse me, why ever would we treat as a god a man that we speak of as our elder brother? We don't want to be doing communion at Easter. And the elders of the church, having been duly elected by the members of the church, said, you better go home, son, and decide if you really want to be a minister. And he decided no. And he went off to Europe and discovered the transcendentalists of Europe and was very happy. But that's another story. He acted from that conscience, from that place of conscience, from that place of what he felt had to be. But something sometimes happens when the democratic process is in place, it's majority rule. Majority rule has a tendency to override the minority's conscience. Yeah, and, and, and the Hebrew rabbis have been wrestling with this one for a few hundred years because synagogues and councils of rabbis are generally managed through election, democratic process. So when a council of rabbis gets, to get, gets together, you know, we've got a dozen or so wise men who've been studying the law, who've been living the law, who've been teaching the law, and a situation comes up and they don't agree. This is hard. What if my interpretation is different from everybody else's? You know, and they don't agree. So there are many, many stories, close to a dozen stories that have woven through the Midrash of different ways different rabbis have wrestled with and come to terms with this. And my favorite one actually is very appropriate for the world we live in today. This world that we're living in right now is a world of change and paradigm shift. And the world of this particular rabbi is also that kind of time. And he has studied and lived and understood and felt a direct divine revelation of what God really meant for one particular passage in the Torah. He felt as if generations of rabbis had spoken to him and he really understood it deep in his heart but none of the other rabbis in the council agreed what to do, what to do. So first they said, well, why don't you recant and we'll elect you to a high position. He said, are you kidding me? <laughs> in my words, not his. He said, I couldn't do that. You know, people would look at me and say, I'd given up what I believed for, for that. No, I couldn't do that. 
so he wouldn't recant. And then they said, well, then we have to ban you from the council because we have to be in agreement. We have to, as the council of rabbis, say this is so. And the Catholic Church, that's the Vatican Council. It's the same thing, the Council of Bishops. They have to agree to say it is so. So this Council of Rabbis says, we have to ban you from the Council. So he spends the rest of his years a rabbi not included in the decision-making process. Now, at that time, and, and for a number of good reasons, it often happened that a rabbi's eldest son became the next in the community to take on the position of rabbi. So as this rabbi, who had not given up for anything his whole life long, was giving up the ghost, he was getting ready to pass on, he brought his son into him. And he said, I cannot, I will not, and I have not recanted, but you need to agree with the rabbi. And the son said, why? We've lived our whole lives with this. And he said, my truth was from my direct experience. Your understanding of it is from one voice. And theirs is many. You must never let the one voice override the many. My truth came from the many of many previous generations. Theirs is the truth of today. You are the coming generation. You must accept and move with theirs. Oh my goodness. This point of law was something that we might consider just a philosophical issue. But it was very meaningful to this one family and this one time. But times changed. And as times changed, the truth of the past may not be the current truth. We have learned much in this generation, post-World War II, that people pre-World War II had no idea was possible, or maybe dreamed of, but didn't see the implications of. And many of the decisions that have been made in our country have been made by people who are thinking in pre-World War II value systems and understandings. They have been the majority, and they have imposed their majority on the rest of us. Majoritization is a form of despotism. It becomes oligarchy, not democracy. How do we know when it is time to let go of an old truth that it is no longer relevant and still be true to our conscience. This is the fundamental decision each of us has to make. Always guarding to know that the majority cannot impose on the minority. Wow. The democratic process is not simple. Now, in a congregation of a fewer than 150 people, we are one family, one mind, truly. And we rarely will fall into that problem. Because in a smallish group, in a group of under 150 people, we have the connections and the opening and the, con the awareness of where people are coming from. One of the things that I teach in, is community development. And in community development, one of the fundamental principles is that every human being relates to seven plus or minus two people, five to nine people. 
And part of that is because that's what the perceptual framework can pick up. I can easily recognize and connect with five or nine or somewhere in between. But you put 10 or 12 on the plate and I may not be able to count them easily. I'd have to count them, I can't just see them, right? And that's how the human mind works, seven plus or minus two. And it turns out that each of us has a spiritual family of seven plus or minus two people. And some of us know it and are in connection with them and some of us aren't. And sometimes those are blood relations and often they aren't. And if we don't feel connected to that many people, we are often in depression because we have been repressing what it is we need to say. Because in our group of seven plus or minus two, our group of five to nine, we can be totally uncensored. Ha, how nice. So we get together with another person and they bring their five to nine people and suddenly we've got 25 to 81 people that we are part of a group. That is our tribe, this group here. This is our tribe. This is where we know that we will be accepted unconditionally, we will be listened to, and our conscience will be honored. It gets tougher when groups of 25 to 81 get together with other groups of 25 to 81. And anthropologists have demonstrated and discovered over the years that almost invariably, once a group gets to 150, it breaks down into two or three smaller groups of 25 to 81 folks. Funny thing how that works. So when we're in that 25 to 81, we can generally come to consensus in a democratic process. When we get to that point of 150, it doesn't work, and that's why we break down to the 25 to 81 groups within the 150. I don't think any of us live in towns of 25 to 81. No. I don't think any of us even live in planned communities of 25 to 81. Our neighborhoods tend to run several thousand people in this country. That would be a market town in traditional community development. And a market town is a network of villages of 25 to 81 folks. <laughs> so what needs to happen in that world is where those groups come to consensus, and then representatives from those groups come to consensus, and then representatives of those groups come to consensus, and so on. But that's not happening. What's been happening is we've shifted from a consensus-based decision-making process to a representative-based decision-making process in which instead of people participating, we say, you go talk to them and they're going to go talk to someone else and so on. And when Congress was formed, there were 26 sen senators and there were fewer than 100 representatives for decades. And then it grew and it grew. We now have 100 senators. That's still under 150, but they're already in multiple groups, aren't they? Look at all the caucuses in the Senate. And how many congressmen do we have? 545. There are 645 people in that house when the State of the Union address is given. Are we surprised Congress is not working? How can the democratic process be effective when you have more people than can come to consensus ever? Ever. So, some of us have been thinking, maybe Thomas Jefferson was right. <laughs> maybe it's time to restructure. I don't know. I'll let you think about that one. But that concept, that awareness that the democratic process is one of groups of people coming to agreement and then working to coming to another level of agreement, consensus agreement, and then working together to come to another level of consensus agreement, is the fundamental basis of the Constitution 
to ensure our liberty and our freedom and our right of conscience. And that has been lost. So what I encourage at this time, because as we did a little write-up, I knew way back in November that we were all going to be getting our mail-in ballots here pretty soon, right? Is find a way in this community to have groups of people coming to consensus and then share that consensus and then share that consensus as you're moving into voting time. You know, am I voting purely on my independent liberal <laughs> consciousness and conscience? Or am I voting on something that I've agreed with others is very important? And is it one and the same? Or am I giving in to the majority opinion? Or am I wishing that my majority was overriding your minority? <laughs> yeah. We, as Americans, grew up in this soup we call the democratic process. You know, in other parts of the world, they're trying to figure it out. There's some beautiful work you can find online on the democratic process unfolding in Russia and Eastern Europe. And, and there's some studies done, you know, where they were effectively functioning as, as um, some kind of parliamentary democracy or representative monarchy or something before the Soviet Union was formed. Those countries made the transition into a more or less functioning democracy pretty easily. But Russia never, ever, ever has had any electoral process until Yeltsin. Are we surprised that they're having a hard time? It's something that we learn, that I get to follow my conscience and find those people who are in agreement with me and work with them and then we discover who else is in agreement. And then we build and develop our capacity to bring forth people who can express what we agree on, not who will tell us what to do. And that's a very important distinction. One other piece of this is that in the time of Lincoln and prior to Lincoln, life moved much more slowly. Okay? I don't know if you, any of you have seen the musical 1776, but there's this wonderful passage where Abigail Adams says, darling, you're only 300 miles away. If you leave tomorrow, you could be here in eight days. <laughs> much more slow, much more time to ponder, <laughs> contemplate, consider. Not built into today's world. <laughs> there is a, a whole group, a religious tradition in this country. It's present in most parts of the world, but buried here. It's a little more visible. It's called Quakerism, the Society of Friends. The Society of Friends, isn't that nice? I kind of like that. In the Society of Friends, every decision is by 100% consensus. No majority rule. Wow. It's a democratic process by right of conscience. And the goal is that everybody have a clear, spirit-based conscience around the decision being made. Wow. And one of the things that people who have used this process have learned is that when there is not agreement, it's usually because there is inadequate information. Not all the information is on the table. It's usually because someone is missing a piece or someone else is you know, bringing something that isn't quite how it is or because the group as a whole has not yet seen the whole picture. 
And so the Quaker method is, we go into the silence. If everyone is agreement, great. If we aren't all in agreement, we disband. We gather more information, we come back, we go into the silence. We check. If everyone is agreement, we go on and do it. And this is the process. And sometimes decisions take weeks and months. But once all the information is in place, and everyone has had adequate time to be in the silence with their own conscience and their experience of the spirit, the oneness, the overall wholeness of being, agreement always happens. Isn't that beautiful? So for a little while, when I was doing some uh, com community consulting and, and business consulting, I, I offered a consensus-based decision-making method that included this. And it was amazing. Where there had been distress, a majority rule, a minority feeling left out, there was no longer. And invariably, the issue had been, we didn't have enough information. So as we come into this season of elections, I strongly encourage you, make sure you have enough information. Take time, ponder, contemplate. Sit with the idea, sit with the concept, sit with the person in your mind or in person. Get to that place where the conscience, your conscience, is absolutely clear. And the decision that you are making is for the whole, as fully informed as possible. And if you come to that with that intention, you don't need to know who owns the media or any of that. You will get the information that you need. It's how it works. Thank you so much. <laughs>